All right, sweet. We're back. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Matt Desmond, or Beer to BDU. Um, today's another amazing session of 30 Minutes to Merge. And today, I get I have the pleasure of introducing my new guest. Uh, this is this is going to be John. He is or at C John Run. Um, as always, when I uh, introduce people, I like to ask a couple of questions just so people get an idea of like who this person really is. Um, so I just kind of want to go through this laundry list of awesome things that I learned about John before today's uh, session uh, and then kick it over to him so that he can uh, rock and roll on his topic. So really quickly, the laundry list of hobbies that John's into is kind of daunting for me. Uh, he's huge into woodworking and metalworking and like the maker space. Um, he's also uh, working on a project called Beer Broadcast, uh, which kind of helps people connect with new beer uh releases from like their favorite breweries that also includes like a podcast. He also has an Airstream. So he's constantly on, on the run in that Airstream. Uh, and when he does find a moment to settle down uh, with, you know, the five kids, <laughs> he, uh, he also likes to bicycle around town and he owns way too many bicycles, but you know, he's always on the look for a new one. Uh, he does have a puppy named Oliver. It's a Brittany, uh, which I learned is no longer called a Brittany Spaniel, but just a Brittany. Uh, and as always, I like to ask our guests who, what like a recent purchase was, uh, and he made two that I thought made the list. So one, he, he bought a headlight for his bike. So, you know, safety is important. Uh, but then he also bought a, uh, propane forge for blacksmithing, uh, cause woodworking and basic metalwork was not enough for John. Uh, when it comes to open source, he's involved in projects as a maintainer, like ice cube and, uh, haste bin. Uh, and then I asked him for some feet, you know, some input on, you know, if you're starting to like look or get into the open space world, you know, what you should do as like a newcomer. Uh, and he had some, some advice. So, you know, if you're maintaining a project, try to work with people, uh, which obviously comes with its own set of problems or issues, uh, or, you know, work, uh, but, you know, kind of divvying up the work across a group of people makes it a little bit easier for you to maintain a project. And then if you're trying to get into the open space, uh, source world, Maybe try to find smaller uh, tasks or projects as opposed to like jumping into like the big monoliths or the big mammoth projects uh, and trying to make a big splash. Start small and work your way up until you become more comfortable. And then finally, as always, I like to ask for like a fun action uh, that they would be interested in making. Uh, and he thought it'd be cool to make some kind of like Peloton leaderboard that uh, kind of created like a small subset of group, like friends that would let you know that, you know, maybe John blasted you. Uh, on his recent ride uh, and to kind of make you more interested in riding again or, you know, at, at a better, uh, I guess, visibility for, for the young kids in the, in the world that, you know, exercising, staying in shape is cool. So I think I ran down all of the cool things I learned about John. John, how's it going? It's going great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool. Thank you for having me, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Always excited to have great guests. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna let you take it away and uh, have fun. Sure. Um, and if people are interested, I can I can always come back and talk about woodworking and metalwork. But uh, today we're going to talk about metaprogramming in Ruby. Um, so first, I just to overview kind of what is metaprogramming uh, and what is Ruby. So uh, we'll start with what is Ruby, which Ruby is a, a scripted programming language uh, that lets you. Um, I guess one thing that's really nice about Ruby is that it's very readable when you're writing it. Uh, Ruby also is the language that you use with Ruby on Rails, which is a web framework that's pretty popular. It's also the web framework that we use for the monolith application at GitHub, which is the core application that powers github.com. Um, when we talk about metaprogramming, what we're mostly talking about is writing code that uh, either modifies or writes code itself. Uh, so the meta part is like when something is meta, uh, when I, when I think about when something is meta, I always think, uh, I used to work at genius, which was called, uh, was rap genius at the time. Um, and there was a, uh, um, genius has different sections for different parts of the site. So they have like a, a rock part, a rap part a books part. Um, but they actually had one part that was internal only. Uh, it was basically the, uh, the internet so to speak of genius and it was called meta.genius.com so when you when you're thinking about meta it's really just um doing something about the thing itself so meta programming is no different we will be programming uh code that itself writes code 
Um, Ruby particularly has a lot of uh, functionality for metaprogramming and a lot of um, functionality for kind of dynamic introspection of code. So we're going to see some of that today. Uh, and the final kind of thing I want to say about metaprogramming before I jump into the actual examples here is that um, you know some of the things I'm going to I'm going to show you're going to see and you're going to say, wow, that's just really wild that you can do that and no one should ever do that. Um, and partially agree with you, but partially also think that in order to, um, you know, understand systems, sometimes you need to understand what's possible. So a lot of the metaprogramming stuff that I'm going to show you, while not directly, um, you know, being something that you'll use, it will be something that helps you understand how maybe the libraries that you're using uh, use it. Because uh, frameworks like Rails or libraries uh, like Hashi or Money or a bunch of other popular libraries actually use metaprogramming under the hood to do the things they do. Uh, also including uh, testing frameworks like RSpec. Okay, so let's uh, jump in. I am going to, can we switch over to the terminal? I don't know how to do it. Great. Okay, so first we're gonna start by uh, calling a method. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna output a string in reverse. So we just say puts hello.reverse. So that takes obviously the string hello, calls the reverse method on it. Uh, and if I go over here, I can actually run that and you'll see that it outputs hello backwards, just like we expected. Now what's actually happening when you do that is you are doing a thing called message passing in Ruby. So you can actually write the exact same statement as puts hello.send reverse. So when you actually call a method in Ruby, what you're really doing is you are sending a symbol uh, to the to that method, sending a message that it should run its reverse method. You're not uh, just calling the method, so you have this ability to to send uh, something, which actually gives you the ability to do something like this. Uh, so probably a better name for that would have been like method name, but just to say that you can actually send, uh, you can send these symbols to different objects and you can uh, have them do something. So we can also show how that will work with, uh, with when the method takes arguments real quick, it would be something like puts hello g sub h. Okay. So what g sub does is it takes the thing, finds all of the occurrences of the first part and replaces them with whatever the second argument is. So if I run this, it's going to change hello into jello. And the uh, method passing version of the same thing would look like this, send g sub h j. So basically anything after the first argument will be passed as arguments to the method itself. Hopefully this is making sense so far, and it's going to become very clear in a minute why I'm even showing you this. So. Just to extend that idea a little bit further, what would you imagine happens when you do something like this? n equals 2 plus 3. Now, in most languages that do some kind of object-oriented behavior, uh, they make an exception for things like primitives, which are, are you know numbers like this. So while objects maybe exist, these numbers are just uh, numbers that exist. You know, They're not part of the object-oriented nature. But Ruby everything's an object, they all work the same way. So actually, when you're doing n equals 2 plus 3, so we'll do puts 2 plus 3, we'll output that, and then we'll do puts 2.send plus to 3. So in Ruby, even addition uh, can be represented essentially as a method passing. So in this case, we are passing the method plus with the argument 3 to the object represented by the number 2. So that should be kind of wild in itself, but we can use that uh, to try to do some examples. So what I'm going to do to try to demonstrate how this works is I'm going to walk through the creation of a basic library that creates typed objects very similar to how the money gem itself works. And uh, don't worry if you don't know how the money gem works, I will describe that as we go. So the, the fundamental problem here is that you have, uh, you have something like $2 and you want to be able to add uh, $5 to that. Now, that's pretty easy because you could represent that in the world as just 2 plus 5. But when you write code like this, you're making, unfortunately, an assumption about those numbers. You're assuming that everyone that works with those numbers knows that those are US dollars. 
So we come into a problem when you do something like $2 plus uh, maybe something like five euro, or you do something like $2 plus um, 50 cents. Basically there's this idea inherent in these types that they're not just numbers, they're actually number plus currency. So what the money gem does is it allows you to create money objects instead like this. And you could add them to other money objects, uh, you know, maybe the same type or maybe different types. And if you try to add types that it can't convert between, because maybe we don't have a way to convert them, uh, maybe you're trying to add US dollars to gigabytes or something, that this would raise an error because there's no way to make a conversion across them. So we'll see right now how to use operator overloading, which is what, it, what it's called when you um, overload the behavior of the plus sign itself. Uh, to accomplish this behavior. Um, feel free to drop any kind of as I'm going through this in the uh, chat, which I th I'm pretty sure I see the chat, um, but I don't, yeah. If, if there's something you wanna say, you can say it and I will try to respond. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to be able to create a money object. So we'll create a class. That class is gonna have an initializer, which will take in a value and a unit. So when we create a money object, we'll do something like this, money that new to USD. And it will say, uh, you know, object one. And then maybe we'll do something like output, what's object one, money. Wow, typing too fast. Okay, so when we run that, we'll see that it outputs uh, basically the object representation of the money object. We'll change that to be a little bit prettier. I will take in these two things and we will make the 2s method defined, which will say basically value unit. Okay, so now it says 2USD instead. So the 2s method is the method that gets called when you just output an object, basically the puts the puts method itself basically takes the object that comes in, calls 2s on it, and then outputs the result of the 2s operation. So what we want to be able to do, I'm going to write it, is we want to be able to do money.new 5 USD. We want to do puts object 1 plus object 2. So let's see what that would look like. If I run that, you're going to get an error. And the error is pretty telling now what we know about operator overloading is that there's an undefined method plus for money. So what it's saying is that we haven't defined the plus method, but we're trying to call it. So all we have to do is go define the plus method. We'll do plus other. And then the answer is basically create a new money object where the, the answer is the value of this object plus value of the other object and the currency of this object. So in order to do that, we need to create a ability to read the other one's value. So we run that and we'll see that the answer is seven USD. So that's pretty amazing already, uh, but we haven't actually got the benefit yet because still what would happen uh, you probably can see the bug is if we change this to five euro and we run that, it's still going to say seven USD. So since we own the behavior of plus now, we can actually do something like this. We can say if the other unit is not equal to this unit, raise an argument error. That we need to add the adder reader for unit and we run that. And you can see that we raise an argument error because we're trying to add two different types of objects that are not compatible uh, together. And we can even add uh, incompatible objects here. I'll run that again, see incompatible objects. Okay, so now we wanna be able to uh, do something like add the USD to the EU. All we have to do inside of our money, uh, and I'm not gonna do this because we're a little, uh, you know, short on time in the session, but all we have to do to do that would be to create a table that basically handles the conversions between one unit and another unit. And then instead of raising just if the units are different, we could raise uh, based on um, whether or not there was a comparison available between the two types of objects. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of take what we have here, which is this foundation and the ability to define uh, operator overloading,
And I'm going to ask a quick question, which you can kind of answer in your heads, which is, if I do something like this, um, dot new, I do object.name equals John, what's actually happening there? So we're creating a new open struct, which is just an empty object. And then we're calling object.name equals John. And this might be pretty surprising, but what's actually happening in Ruby is we're doing object.send to a method that ends in an equal sign, the argument John. So these two lines are roughly equivalent to each other. When you call name, you're actually calling name equals with a first argument that is the right side of the assignment operation. So with that in hand, we can actually go and we can create an object where when you do an assignment on an individual property, it responds in a certain way. So let's write some version of that real quick. Uh, we will do class something. And in here, we'll put name equals name. And then we will do uh, puts. We tried to set the name to name. And then over here, we'll just do something.new, that name equals John. And run that. And we can actually see that now we have hooked into not only addition in the last example, we're also able to hook into property assignment. So when we hook into property assignment, um, we are able to hook into an individual property. But what if we wanted to be able to uh, do something like have multiple of these methods? We would have to write each individual property that we wanted to add all here right next to each other. Now, what we can do instead is we can actually do something that is metaprogramming, which is called method missing. So I will try to describe how method missing works. And then we're going to go through a whole example using method missing to implement uh, another library. So here in method missing, uh, I'm going to start by doing uh, puts hello.piglat. And when I do that and I run it, you're going to see this error, which is undefined method pig Latin for hello string. And uh, you can look it up, but actually what's happening here is that when you call pig Latin, it's not found. And when something's not found, Ruby will call a method with a particular name. It's called method underscore missing, which exists on basic object. And if you actually look up the source code for a basic object in Ruby, which you can find, you don't, know, you don't even have to clone it. You can go to rubydoc.org and look it up. You'll find that basically the implementation of basic object uh, is just essentially uh, class basic object, uh, def method missing. Uh, this takes a method name and a set of args. And all this really does is raise no method error. And then uh, object inherits from basic object and uh, string inherits from object. So string. Uh, looks for the method pig Latin. If it's not found, it goes, hey, object, do you have the method? It's not found. It goes to basic object. It says, do you have the method? Method missing. And it actually says, no, I don't. I have the method. Sorry, I do have the method, method, method missing. So run it. Inside of there, it does raise no method error, which is actually how we get this no method error on the right-hand side. So using that, we can actually, um, we're not going to define pig Latin in this example at any individual level. But what we can do instead is we can choose to define method missing at a higher level. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to make a, a method missing object, uh, you know, a, a method that works with method missing. So we'll do class something again. And in here, we'll do uh, method missing. Take in the two arguments that method missing needs, which is method name and args. Uh, we will output the method name. So we'll say you called method name. And then we'll do something.new.pig Latin. And we'll go run it. And when we run it, you'll see that instead of getting an error that the pig Latin doesn't exist, it's done the thing that I kind of hinted that it would do. It outputs you called and then the name of the method. So our method missing has essentially given us the ability to override what happens when a method isn't defined. So that will let us uh, do some pretty neat things. So let's test another thing. Something that new, that name is John. Let's run that. 
So you can see here, you called pig Latin and you called name equals. So this is just kind of proving even more that that new that name plus five. I end method plus for nil class. Ah, I say I did this wrong. Let me that new plus five. So you can see here that it's doing exactly what I said, which is method missing is overriding all of these behaviors. So what can we do with that? Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to create a library uh, that some of you may have used out in the world. That library is called Hashi. Um, I'm going to try to create a basic implementation of the Hashi, Hashi library using method missing um, in, I guess, five to seven minutes, which should be fun. OK, so the way that Hashi works is, uh, and I'll just write out how we're going to use it, and then we'll go to start implementing it. The way Hashi works is that you should be able to do hashi.new to create a hash. And then instead of using it like a normal hash, where you would do something like uh, you know, property name equals value, instead what you'll do is hash.property name equals value. So you'll be able to do things like hash.name is John, hash.kidcount is five. And then you also should be able to read those things back out. So you should be able to say um, puts uh, hash dot name has hash dot kid count. So our goal is to make that work. It's basically an open object where you can assign any properties that you need. And just for fun, we should also be able to do uh, hash dot each do key value. Okay. So in here, we'll just put this key. So this is the kind of the, the contract that we're going to try to go for with the hashy object using method missing. We'll start in here by implementing uh, the method, method missing method, method name, star args. And all we'll do in here is I'll output the method name so we can see what gets called. And if I run that, you're going to see first name equals gets called, which is lining up to here, then kid count, then name, then kid count, then uh, what is this? The next is, yeah, you have the blank has blank kids. Uh, that's outputting from the put statement on line 18. And then you have each, which is called here. Uh, note here that because we haven't defined what each does, the inner part of the block never gets called. OK, so we'll start with uh, name uh, name itself. So in our initializer for the hash, initialize, we will just create a um, inner store, which will just be an empty hash for now. And then in method missing, what we'll do is if the method name ends with uh, equal sign, output uh, setting property property name. We need to be able to get that property name, which is just going to be equal to the method name uh, from zero, pushing off the last letter. I run that, uh, sorry, and 2s. You'll see here setting property name and setting property kid count. So now we have access to the thing that needs to be actually set. So all we have to do is take the inner store and at the property name position in the inner store, we will place uh, args.first. The reason we want args.first is because remember the First, the only argument passed to an assignment overridden method is the thing on the right side of the equal sign. So args.first is the thing that is passed to method missing. So if you run this now, we'll see uh, the output just there. And we should actually be able to write our else now too. So the else is the uh, read a property. This one is the write. In our else, all we have to do is do inner store of method name, sorry, of property name. And similar to property name up here, this will be method name, except this time we don't want to take the last letter off. We just want to uh, take the property name. So to uh, ask, because we need to convert it to a string. So run that. And now we get the output, John has five kids. So just with this little amount of code, we've created an object that can take in any property called on it, it can assign things and it can read them out. The only thing we have left to do now is we have to implement each for the last part of this example. So all that each should do 
is it should uh, be able to um, yield the key and value for each iteration. We could just use a, a delegate here, but what we'll do instead is we'll just write it out. Uh, inner store at each do key value. We'll do yield key value. And if I run that, you'll see now the property is just like we promised, which is name and kid count. Okay, so what's wrong with this implementation? There's one thing that I have to say is wrong with it before I uh, before I'm kind of done with the example here. And the thing that's wrong here is the um, uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you actually what's wrong, which is if I go in here and I I'll just do it over here actually. I output um, hash. I'm going to say does the hash respond to uh, the name method. And if I run that, you're going to see false at the bottom. So the problem here is now that the hash doesn't think it responds to a method that it definitely does respond to. Um, that's not a huge problem, but it is a problem. So there is actually a way to fix it. And the way you fix it is you define another method called respond to missing. This one takes also method name and args. And it's meant to return a Boolean about whether or not that method should act like it exists. So, you know, the simplest version of this would just be to write true, as um, that's a pretty accurate representation of what we're doing here. Meaning, like, there either something ends with an equal sign, in which case it exists, or it doesn't, in which case it exists. So, in this in this naive implementation, true is the way to go. But just to know that when you define method missing, you also need to uh, define respond to missing. So I think this is kind of like I, enough to give you a peek into the power of what you can do uh, with Ruby metaprogramming. There's other things that you should look into if you're interested in this, like define method, instance eval, class eval. Uh, Ruby lets you define methods on the fly. Ruby lets you define methods on pre-existing objects, essentially reopening classes to define methods. Uh, Ruby lets you list the methods that are available to call on different objects. Uh, you can eval code against other objects, you can call private methods from outside objects. Uh, Ruby is super wild. So if you are interested uh, in somewhere where you can kind of like, you know, learn more about the structure of how um, how code works and how it kind of inter interchanges with each other, um, there are plenty of examples you can read about this in the wild, and it's definitely something uh, to look into for yourself. So yeah, that's kind of it. I'm back. Okay, so first off, that was nuts. And I appreciate you kind of taking a deep dive like you did for us today. Um, I know that you had also kind of said that you were interested in um, coming back, which is always fun for me to hear. Um, but I know that you had an idea for a talk, so I wanted to kind of give you the opportunity to introduce your idea, and then hopefully chat will come back and tell us that it's awesome, or maybe we need to take it back to the drawing board and, and throw it back at them. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that I'm a, um, I guess like we, I don't know if we said my role earlier. I'm a principal software engineer at GitHub, which means I work on things that are uh, kind of important across the entire organization. Uh, I've worked at a lot of other places. I've been an engineering manager in the past. And uh, as a result of kind of all these different roles, I do end up seeing like, um, you know, reading a lot of resumes and seeing a lot of engineers kind of trajectory through different levels. And what I'm particularly interested in is uh, kind of sharing some things that I think I've learned about getting started as a software developer, what it takes to kind of, um, you know, to to move between levels and what it kind of means to be the different the different levels, at least in my opinion, kind of like as, as you grow as a software engineer, what you can expect around how your role will change, how your life will change, how your interactions with others will change, uh, because each engineering level is really, um, is really very different from the one before it. Yeah, so hit us up in chat. Let us know if you're interested, because I'd, I'd love to have John come back. Um, and maybe you just want him to dive into Ruby again. <laughs> uh, Always down to do that, too. Yeah, I, It's very apparent just based on today's session, uh, where you just kind of like immediately deep dived into like, here's all the crazy stuff that you can do uh, as, a, as a, like a, a preview. So very cool. Um, as always, I appreciate uh you showing up hanging out with me and uh everyone else in on the stream hanging out and checking out what we had to offer 
Uh, quick plug, GitHub Universe is next week, uh, which is going to have a really awesome set of uh, announcements. There's going to be people sharing all the cool, crazy stuff that they do with GitHub, um, and I'm super excited for it. And then, um, yeah, I don't think I've got anything else that I've got to say uh, from the handlers. Not getting any like, hey, don't forget. So that's always fun. It means I'm doing my job right. Uh, but yeah, so thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this session of 30 Minutes to Merge. Uh, we'll have another one next month. And uh, just keep us, uh, just keep telling us what you want to hear. And we'll keep getting great guests like John and others kind of share cool stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks again for joining. It's a great time to be a hover. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.